Good evening, Austin. Welcome to the Jeff Davis Show. Uh, Jeff is on vacation, so Joyce Isaac and myself uh, have uh, filled in for Jeff while he's on vacation. And as our guest, we have Madeline Duncan Brown, the author of Texas in the Morning. Subtitle is The Love Story of Madeline Brown and President Lyndon Baines Johnson. I was in advertising and we had some of the largest clients in America and uh, I was invited to a party at the Adolphus Hotel by KTBC. They were giving a big party honoring uh, the campaign workers over the Box 13 scandal. So when Jess Kellum, who was the general manager of KTBC, invited me, he said, put your dancing shoes on and come on over. And so I did and it was like uh, Alice in Wonderland for me. So that night I met Lyndon and uh, some of the other big people. So he invited me to come to Austin to the Driscoll Hotel three weeks later. And that's when our relationship started at the Dr Driscoll Hotel, I'll say it. Uh, he put a key in my hand and I knew what it meant. Mm -hmm. Tell them about uh, your experience there in the advertising agencies uh, that you were an account executive for the different ones. Who might tell the names of those agencies. Some of the bigger clients. Yes, well, right. Brown and Root, we did some of their work for them. And, of course, uh, uh, we had KTBC. All of our clients placed time on KTBC. Right. Uh, Texas and Pacific Railroad, Lone Star Brewing Company, Republic National Bank, Bell Helicopter, they were the, some of the larger accounts in Texas. So you, the, the ad agency was connected with the big ones? Oh, yes, definitely. Southland Life Insurance. Mm -hmm. That was one and of the biggest political accounts we had. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And which did mean political accounts because during the elections still, they buy uh, political time, all the candidates do, if they can afford it, that is. Right. But there was a lot of uh, political uh, advertisement going on coming into your agency, right? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was uh, going over some of the uh, contracts, uh, I was told, don't you bother KTBC. And uh, I said, well, Southland Life is on a one-time rate. And they said, leave it alone. Don't you bother it. So I knew to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Show up and go to work. Okay. Well, when the, when the, how often did you see Lyndon? When uh, any time he was in Texas, I uh, meet him at the Driscoll Hotel, sometime at the uh, Minger in San Antonio, and the Lamar in Houston. But most often, it was the Driscoll Hotel. And uh, by the way, we we visit we revisited the Driscoll we did, this afternoon, some tears. <laughs> and uh, went over the old stomping grounds. About the only thing that was really familiar were the marble steps going up to the ballroom. That, mm -hmm. that it's going through major renovations, so so many things have changed. Mm -hmm. I, I miss the coffee shop and the bar, you know, right. and, uh, it was so quiet. <laughs> well, the whole town was so quiet then Today. because we're talking about 1948. When you first met him, Lennon in 48? 48. 48. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And it was small. I mean, I'd, I'd turn around trying to find out or for my memory you know and it was it was so changed right. and I just couldn't uh, I couldn't see all of it okay so you'd met uh, Lennon uh, off and on for several years uh, when did you find out the magic thing that that, that you were I carrying was, his child well that does bring tears <laughs> <laughs> um, it's brought that's brought tears to a lot of us <laughs> right. <from time> <laughs> Well, of course, in those years, it was before the pill, right. and there were very little contraceptives, if any, that I knew about. And, of course, I was smart enough to know it could happen, but I was hoping against hope it didn't happen. Right. You know? Never happens to me. Right. So when uh, I went to the doctor, and he said, I hate to tell you, but you're pregnant. Oh, it was raining that day, and the, the rain against the windows, and I thought, this is the end for me. I know, you know. So I knew I first had to tell my parents, and I had the most wonderful Christian parents that a child could have. Everything was just beautiful. So I first went out to Keys Park, and I said to myself, I, 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 this is one thing I can't get out of. I don't know what I'm going to do. But anyway, I 
dark kind of like drove me back home and I went in and that was before television by the way right. it came soon after that but here George I called him George was sitting and and he your was father reading, your reading the paper and this test pattern was on the you know <laughs> well uh, we all used to sit and watch test pattern well yeah. men still would but <laughs> were, were it still on right so I said Finally, I just blurted it out. I said, George, I got to tell you something. I'm, I'm pregnant. Well, it just rocked the house, you could tell, you know. And, and uh, I said, he's a married man, and that made it worse. So he, he got up from the, the chair, and, and uh, he took his handkerchief, and he went to blotting tears, and I was crying, you know. And Mother wasn't in there at that point. So he said, uh, well, we'll work it out. And I thought, how can you work out something, you know, like this? So anyway, um, we got through that. Uh, George went and talked to the uh, Catholic priest right there by the house, and he went to Dr. Langston, and he said, well, we'll, we'll get this all worked out. Well, that it still wasn't worked out, you know. I had right. to tell Lyndon. You can't undo something you like can't that. Do, undo. No, that's right. So anyway, uh, Jess Kellum called me and told me to... Uh, come to uh, who, who's, who was Jess Kellum? Then? That was Lyndon's hatchet man in Texas, as well as running his all of his broadcast property. Okay. Uh, he was the one. So uh, when I get to the Driscoll Hotel and uh, I go upstairs, and when Lyndon walked in, I went to cry, and he said, "Oh, you've missed me." I said, "Yes, I have <laughs> missed you." You know. And so he said, "Well, what's so wrong?" And then I blurted out that I was pregnant, and he had a fit, and then I was more frightened, you know. And so because he had a temper, and no yeah, telling what he might do. Well, he uh, took a lamp and crashed it. It was really an ugly experience. So finally, when he calmed down a little bit, he uh, he said, "Well, it takes two to tango," and um, I was relieved. I was really relieved that he said that. He told me that there would be an attorney in Dallas, Jerome Ragsdale, that would take care of everything. And he said, if this leaks out, I've just got over this Box 13 scandal. He said, uh, and I'm not going to let this destroy my political career. Okay, now uh, somewhere in here I think we need to tell people, because I, I found this, uh, well, as a woman, I find this an interesting part of the story. You really never considered having an abortion. Not real, not me. He did. He he wanted. At first, he said you can have an abortion, and because of my religious beliefs, you're I a good do Catholic it. girl, well, right? I couldn't do it. But but you had told me when we talked earlier that there was an abortion clinic somewhere close to your it house, sure even though at that time it was illegal supposedly. But if you had the money you could get this taken care of. Well, it didn't require a lot of money. All you had to do, if you had $25, was knock on the door. Dallas didn't have any organization. It was had been the murder capital of the world. You could gamble. You could call Jack Ruby. Um, anything went in Dallas. In Dallas, right. Yeah. If you wanted to be a prostitute, you went down to the city and got your little card. They gave you a health card, and uh, you operated over on Ackert Street. Mm -hmm. What was the price of a contract in those days? Uh, well, to get someone just beat up real good, ten, fifteen dollars. <laughs> <laughs> if uh, you wanted like someone, <laughs> well, this is serious here. If you wanted someone to uh, say just expire, that cost you a hundred at, at least. Well, so everything had its price. It had its price. But no one bothered anyone. I mean, everyone knew where certain things, the mob, the mafia, but no one bothered They just them. went about their business. Uh, yeah. Minded their own business. We, mm -hmm. we know better. Yeah. <laughs> or we knew better. Yeah. Uh, how long did Stephen live, and uh, when did he find out who his father was? He uh, found out in the middle 70s, really, is when our money stopped the support coming in and I'd had a heart attack. Uh, he died when he was 39 of lymphatic cancer mm -hmm. and researching all of this uh, it was the same type of cancer that Linda's mother Rebecca had. And his sister? And I'm not sure what Rebecca had okay. uh, but she did have cancer. But 